All right, so welcome tonight, guys. I am super excited for this one, and thank Josh for coming out and spending more time with us. Uh, yeah. This this training's a little bit more exclusive. Last time we opened it up to uh, the public, we had more people on, so we'll probably have a little bit of a tighter audience tonight, but um, I'm excited because I want to encourage you guys, and Josh will encourage you this too, but if you have not watched part one of this training, make sure you do that because everything Josh is going to talk about tonight will make a lot more sense when he, when you go through that, he did a phenomenal job. We had so much great feedback from everybody and um, you know, it was really a, a great, great training. Um, so you want to review that, go through it. <coughs> and then of course, you know, if you're here with us live, you can watch this one again uh, on the recording and uh, you know, should be, should be really, really good. So, um, Hold on one second. We're going to. Um, the chat is disabled. And Zoom is just like doing some weird stuff lately. So I, believe me, uh, it's something with Zoom doing these updates because I was doing the MLSP webinar last week and they had the exact same problem. So Zoom is doing some weird stuff that's keeping it from, from happening. But um Anyway, Robin's going to uh, to check into that and get that set for us. So, uh, but yeah, so we want to make sure number one that you guys get in there, watch that that number one if you haven't, and then um, okay, well, let's see here. I turned it on. <laughs> oh, you, you, you you turned it on. Okay, perfect. You knew. It. Okay. <laughs> I was I was like, oh, I have controls because I'm yeah, co-host. Right. I mean, I like, co oh, you know, I'll just turn it on here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> You're gonna have to show me because I don't even know. So sounds good, yeah. But uh, okay, good, awesome to have you guys. Um, one other thing, um, I wanted to ask any of you guys: Are any of you guys going out to Ray Higdon's Rank Makers Live event? I don't know if any of you guys are, but uh, I'm excited because Ray just asked me to speak at his event, and I'm gonna nice. be teaching on some video marketing stuff and repurposing video and all that stuff that we've been talking about a lot lately. So if you guys are going to be out there, I would love to see you guys and um, hang out with you. So that's the plan right now. I'm planning on flying down there, going to hang out. Um, so if uh, you want to come hang, that'd be a good, good time. So, all right. So I don't want to delay. I want to get into this, um, but we're going to rock and roll. So email deliverability secrets part two. Um, I'm excited to have you out again, man. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited Schoenert. to be here. I'm still trying to get your last name, Schoner, right? Schonert. Schonert. <laughs> Close. Like, hey, you know what? You got the vowel right. Schoenert. I know, right? I was like scone, scone like a donut. Scone. <laughs> no, it's Schoner. All right, I'll get it right one of these times. But anyway, thanks for coming out again, man. Yeah. And sharing your knowledge. I know people absolutely loved it last time, and I'm sure tonight's gonna be great too. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to be back on and, you know, be able to do something a little bit more exclusive because what we're going to go through tonight is going to be like the last time was deep in like the knowledge kind of foundation side of it. Now we're actually, so I've got it set up. I actually have a new domain I'm building up as another part of my business and I have purposely not done anything with it. So that way I can literally, I'm going to be walking through the entire process of how I do email deliverability, what tools I use, everything. Like it's, it's literally going to be like, after this, people who are watching this could probably even go like do it step-by-step step themselves. Oh, that's awesome. I yeah. love it. I'm excited about it. And, um, this is, this is what TLS is all about. It's about sharing some of this stuff, you know, and this is, this is a tech hall, by the way, Angie's usually on tonight, but we booted her out for this. Month. Thanks Angie. <laughs> She'll be back next month. And, uh, but um, that's really what this one is all about is to help you get some of the know how on that and uh, to get rocking with it. But I want to point out also, okay, if you go through it tonight and, you know, you feel like, um, you know, this is just too much for you and you want to hire Josh out, reach out to him and you can pay him to, to do some of this stuff for you. Um, but you know, if you feel adventurous and you feel like you can do it, check it out. You know, sometimes it's a good thing to struggle through it a little bit and learn a little something. You know? Oh yeah. So, I mean, that's how I got here. I, I didn't just wake up one day and go, Hey, I know how to do this. You know, it was, yeah. 
time of putting in the work and learning it and understanding what works and what doesn't. And, yep. you know, that's just, that's why I love doing these things because it's one of the things that I know you're the same way, Mark, like providing good service to other people, not even good, great service to other people yeah. is so fulfilling. And that's why, like, I love how TLS is centered around just providing so much value. Yeah. And it's why I've been in it for almost a year now is because it's just, it's one of those things where it's so great to be able around a community of people who are more focused on actually making other people better instead of giving like the 90% and then just like wildly monetizing the other 10%. Yeah. I, I honestly, like one of, one of my things, like I, I hate holding anything back. Like I can't, it's not in me. Like you gotta <laughs> give it all or you don't give none. You know? That's why we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, you know? So yeah, you guys, um, lock in, um, you know, uh, take some, some good notes here. Do you guys hear me? Okay. By the way, is my audio a little low or does it seem okay? I don't know. Robin was saying I sounded a little bit low. Okay. Maybe it wasn't me then. Maybe. Cause I was like, it uh-huh. sounds really low for me. How's that? Does that sound a little better? Is that going up? Well that, th- so on that mic, that volume there, that's for your output. Really? Yeah. So maybe the gain on the back is really low. So it's like the top button on the back. Yeah. How's that? Is that better? Better, um, better, better, better. No, no, no. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. That got better. All right. How's that? Okay. All oh right. yeah. All right. Well, maybe that was it. All right. Now, now I'm, I was, I was like going crazy there for a minute. I was like, it's, it's quiet, but. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is like every time I create a video, I always have to do a little trick on the editing platform to get my audio higher. Uh, and maybe that's why that could be, <laughs> so, anyway. it's, it's very possible. Like everybody's saying better, better, better. Yes. Yeah. All right. Sweet. <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. I'm going to turn it over to you, Josh. We've been chit chatting long enough. Let's get into the email stuff. I'm going to yeah. cut out my video and turn it over to you, man. It's all Sounds you. good. Yeah. Appreciate it. And yeah, like we talked about just a second ago, we know, so tonight is going to be a basically step-by-step walkthrough And like I was telling Mark, I've got a domain that I have not done anything with yet. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through my entire process, what I look for, because last time, right, we talked about all of the things we talked about SPF, you know, sender policy framework, we talked about the DKIM, the domain keys identified mail, we talked about DMARC, I'm I'm not even going to try to go into that one. That's a long, long acronym. But we talked about all these things that are doable. And, you know, I did mention on like BIMI records, I'm not going to go through a BIMI record today because I'm still waiting on my trademark. And that's one of the requirements for BIMI. So we're going to go through an SPF creation. We're going to go through DKIM. We're going to go through the DMARC setup. And we're going to actually walk through a, an example DMARC report. And I'm going to walk through setting up on Google Postmaster and show you guys how Google Postmaster works so you know what to look for. Like, we're really going to go deep into the actual how-to of this, which like Mark said, which is why this is really just for TLS, because this is literally going to show you exactly how to do it. And so, and like Mark said too, if you haven't watched the first section, right? So the email deliverability secrets, if you haven't watched part one, definitely go watch that still hang out with us have a good time you know feel free to put questions in the chat so i can answer questions on the fly because sometimes those questions do actually they're relatable and it's easier to answer them at the time instead of trying to go back and you know figure it out but i'm going to do my best to explain everything as i'm going through and what i'm going to do is once i share my screen i am going to turn off my video because i am on an older laptop i'm waiting for a new one to get built so i just want to save bandwidth so you guys can see a clear screen but as far as it goes if there's anything throughout the process i like interaction i like being able to answer questions as we go so then that way we can make sure that those show up at the time especially when we're doing walkthroughs like this because that may be something I can quickly go back, you know, one or two steps versus going all the way back at the end. So feel free to be vocal or not, um, you know, whatever feels comfortable for you. And I'm going to share my screen here. And what I'm going to do is the first thing I'm actually going to do is let me do this. I'm going to do share screen and we're going to go to do, 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 screen three. So you're going to get a, a, a real good look at my 
kind of back office, I guess we'll say, as what I do. And let me go ahead and kill my video. And boom. Okay. So I've got the chat up here. Can everybody let me know? Can you see my screen okay? Just in the chat real yep, quick. You're good, dude. I okay, see you're it. good. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. So perfect. So this is my domain controller, okay? So anybody who buys any sort of custom domain, you're gonna have something. Some people have GoDaddy or Namecheap or SiteGround, you know, all these other ones. This is mine. And I actually, I have not been using my shownerdmarketing.com domain for email quite yet. I just got an email account for it because I'm working on doing some other service-based stuff with my business. And so in here, the place that you're going to be in pretty much the entire time is called DNS or domain name servers. And this is a list here. Now, I'm not really going through like a walkthrough of every different type of you know domain provider. So if you need help figuring out how to do DNS records for your domain provider, generally you can search the, their help records and just ask for updating DNS records or, you know, check on their training. They're going to show you how to do it for their stuff. For mine, it just says DNS and name servers. And then I come in here and go to DNS records. But you're going to see, I do have a lot of stuff that seems to be already set up. And that's because I have this already tied up with a couple different services. And all of these different things you see in here are all just different things that were automatically put in here, like the Google records for email and a couple different things for like, like this IP address in an SPF record is here, which we'll go over that a little bit more. But there's definitely some things I've already put in place, but I haven't done the email side of it. And so we're going to walk through the email side and I'm using Google Workspace as my email provider. That's one of the big ones that people are going to see. There's also, you know, Microsoft 365 and Zoho and, you know, I think there's a SiteGround and Namecheap have their own ability to do email hosting within there for their own professional stuff. GoDaddy has their own. And, but for Google Workspace, the big thing here is, uh, and I'm actually going to go back to the homepage. So I have two accounts in Google Workspace. And when we come into this one here, so Google Workspace, you're going to have kind of like your main admin panel. And on the left side, you're going to have apps. And down here, you're going to have another, normally it's going to be kind of brought down like this, but you're going to have Google Workspace. You open that up and there's Gmail. And then inside here, you're going to have this authenticate email section. And you'll notice it says set up email authentication or DKIM or DKIM. And that's really in Google Workspace, that's where it's going to be. In most places, you can usually have like a search bar at the top. I could just type in DKIM and you'll notice it, it could take me right there, right? So if I hit DKIM, it's going to bring me in. Now, this one says it's authenticating already because that's my main domain that, you know, is branded to my wife and I. That's what's already set up. But we're going to change this over to my other domain. So if you're using Google Workspace, you'll have a shownertmarketing.com. You'll have like multiple domains if you have more than one, or you might just have one. But we're going to see this one says not authenticating email. So a little tidbit from the first one. The reason why we do this is to help provide better deliverability. And the DKIM record actually tells the email providers like Yahoo, AOL, Zoho, ProtonMail, it tells them you are the person who owns this domain. So, so any email address on that domain, doesn't matter how many you have, any of them that you use will end up having this authentication record. And so basically here, the nice thing about Google is that they give you the opportunity to just generate a record it's going to ask for the length of the DKIM. Most of the time, you won't have to change this. Some services, uh, there was an, an off the wall one I worked with one time that you had to change it to this 1024, but generally you're not going to have to change that. And for Google, I always leave it as the Google selector because it's what this is, the prefix selector. It's your way to set kind of like a, a naming convention for this DKIM key. So some people, they might have subdomains or they might have, uh, you know, some sort of other reasoning why they might change the naming convention of it. But for the 99% out there, you're probably not going to have anything different. 
So for here, we're just going to go ahead and hit generate record. And this is going to give us these two things. First, it's going to give us the host name. So the host name is basically what tells the email providers this is the value that aligns to said service, which is why I leave it to Google because it's not, it doesn't make a difference really in terms of what you name it, but it just, that's what it identifies to line up with this key. Because when you actually put this in, it's going to bring that over and it's going to connect those two together and say, hey, this name goes with this key and that's how they verify that it's you. So here's how we actually insert this in, okay? So we go in here and we take this Google domain key and make sure like most of these, it won't let you have extra spaces, but some tools might give you just like a, a box and you can get extra spaces in there. Just make sure when you paste it in, you don't have any extra spaces. And so here under the DNS records, I have this button that says add DNS record. So when I do that, it's going to give me this box here. You're going to see similar stuff with most tools. Like GoDaddy has a similar look. Namecheap has a similar look. Uh, a lot of them are built the same way. But the first thing is that domain name goes in this name field here. So the Google dot underscore domain key, that goes here. The type is actually going to be a text record. And let me show you what's really cool about the way Google does this is they actually say text record name. Most tools that give you the ability to authenticate like this are going to have that, you know, Google dot domain key, and it's going to say like, you know, text record name. So most of them are all going to have like a dot underscore domain key at the end. So now, now that we put that in, so we have the name there, we have the text record type. Now we need the content and the content is going to be this text record value. So anytime you see name and value, that's going to be the name box and the content, sometimes they call it value, sometimes they call it info, whatever they call it, the usually that's where you're going to put the information. And so we want this entire long key. Now, I've had questions where people say, why is it so long? And why does it have to be so many different obscure things? Because I'll never remember that. Well, that's the point, right? Is the reason this is so big and so long is you don't want someone to be able to take this key and go use it somewhere else because you want this to be authenticated to you. This is your unique identifier to say you are who you say you are and it's only generated by your account. This is how it links everything together. So in this situation, it's so long and so obscure for that reason. So nobody else can try to pretend like they're you. So I copied that out. And I'm going to go back over to my domain DNS records, and I'm just going to paste this in. Don't try to type that out. <laughs> I've had people tell me they took forever trying to type these things out. If you can't copy paste, figure out how you can copy paste. Don't do like screenshot and try to type it because you're just going it, to, it's just going to be bad. So time, the TTL time to live. If you don't have a default, like mine doesn't have a default. So I just choose one hour. GoDaddy, Namecheap, most of the others, they'll have what says like default, which usually it's 30 to 60 minutes, I think for most of them. Some of them are one day. It just depends on the actual tool. And then priority. Now this box stays in here for mine because they just have the same record for everything. You don't have to use priority for the DKIM records. Priority is mainly only used for MX records, which we won't be doing much with MX records right now or at least not in the in this specific situation. But I am gonna walk you through setting up a tool, an actual email tool, and show you how to use like custom domains and things like that. So, so this one's good. I'm just gonna hit add DNS. And now when I scroll down, so mine always adds them at the end. So when I scroll down, now I can see I have this text record down at the end and it's already there. And now what I can do now, they have these messages here that say it may take up to 48 hours for DNS changes to fully propagate. Every tool says something along those lines. Sometimes they'll say 36, sometimes they'll say one to two days. Generally 24 to 48 hours is kind of on the long end. Most of the time you can usually come right back into Google or whatever tool you're using and verify and get these done. Records are usually going to be pretty quick very rarely are you going to run into a situation where you have to wait the full 20, 
24 or 48 hours. But I will say it has happened. I can't say that that's not true, but it's definitely one of those things where it's pretty quick. So if I hit start authentication, we can see there now it changed to stop authentication because now my status is authenticating email with DKIM. Now, here's what's interesting about this. I didn't go create a manual record. I didn't go try to use a tool to figure out how to do this. Most services and email marketing tools and platforms will give you a system like this. They're going to literally walk you through how to do it, or at least give you the ability to get the, the records and put them in there yourself. You don't have to build these things out manually. It's, I mean, back in the day, from what I've learned from people that have done this a long time ago, you used to have to figure out how to generate these keys with other tools or, you know, specific plugins and things like that. Now it's pretty much straightforward on most platforms. But if you don't know where you're going, stuff like this is easy to get lost. So this part's done with this one. So what we're going to do is now we need to add an SPF record. So most places will tell you what the SPF record is. So I can come in here and I can say, you know, SPF, and then it'll say like, there's all these different things, you know, um, options, but like spoofing and authentication is not necessarily what people think it is. So don't get confused. I have a really cool tool that I'm going to show you and I'll put a link to it in the chat. And so I have all of my organization here. So I'm going to go to my lookup tool. So this is a really neat tool from MX Toolbox. It's free. And I'm going to put this in here for you guys. So this tool is actually a, a how-to on how to enable SPF and DKIM records for quote unquote popular email service providers. This is generally how I will find SPF records for my clients because it's not always straightforward. Like for Google, it's just underscore SPF.google.com. That one was pretty easy to memorize, but some like, let's say for example, um, Postmark, which is a tool you'll see come up later. Theirs is like MCSV or SRV, something like that. Like some of them have very obscure names. And so what I will do is over here, you'll see they have a few groups on the left up here. And these groups basically show where to go in terms of like the naming convention. So I want to go to Google. So I need to go to F through L and it's going to bring up this list of all these different providers. So if you haven't already bookmark this link somewhere, because this will literally walk you through most of the tools. Now, when I come down here, I can come through this and I can go, okay, I need to find Google right here. Google dash G suite or G suite is the old name for Google workspace, but it's still technically they can call it G suite sometimes. So we're going to click on that. And it's going to load this screen and check this out right there says, if you have an existing record, or if you don't have an existing record, however you decide to do it, but they give you the instructions right here on what to do. Now, not every tool is as detailed as this. Some of the tools that show up in these providers, they'll maybe have a, a different, uh, a different convention. Maybe it's a link to go to, or, or whatever the case may be, but this one easy enough. I can copy this record right here. And I can say, I just need to do underscore spf.google.com. Now this include is very, very important. You can't just copy the underscore in here and say, oh, we're just gonna copy that and call it good. You need the entire thing here because that include colon, that is the most important piece to tell the email providers that this is where, this is one of the places that you can send emails from. SPF, they call it sender policy framework, but I say it's the anti-spoof record because if somebody decided to send an email on your behalf without your authorization and they were sending it from a tool that's not on this SPF record, then it's going to generally block them from doing that. Now, one thing I will put out there is that in the event that someone tries to spoof your email and they're using a version of Google Workspace, Technically, it will, quote unquote, let it through, but that's where your DKIM comes into play. These two together are basically your, you know, your one fist and the other fist, right? That's, that's your defense. You know, you're, you're basically 
putting your fists up to block your face kind of thing. If for people out there that might that it might have been maybe, you know, karate or you know, boxers in the past. Um, but anyway, so we copy that record and we're gonna come over here and we're gonna do the same thing as we're gonna go up and create a new record. And in this record, in the name field, or sorry, take that back. It, normally, if we created a new record, we would do the name field be at, because that's for your domain. Now, if you have a subdomain, it would just be like whatever your subdomain is. But you would do a new record, which would be at, the type of record would be a text record, and the content would be V equals SPF1. So if we go back to the other page, you'll notice it kind of has that down here. Like if you don't have a, a record, it kind of gives you that naming convention. Now you could just come in here and just copy all this, make it easy on yourself. But I'm, I'm gonna explain actually what these mean, okay? So the V equals SPF1 is just saying that this is an SPF record. The include field is saying that you want to include all of this, like this domain, anything that comes from the google.com domain. And then the little squiggly or tilde, and then all at the end, this is what's called a soft fail. So if it fails this, it doesn't general, generally like reject it. It just tells the email provider, hey, this potentially may not be from somebody that, that we know that's aligned here. Now you could do a hyphen instead, hyphen all would be basically a hard fail, where if it didn't align with your SPF record, it would not go through, period. I generally use the hyphen for all of my records because I wanna be a little bit more strict. Some people don't want to have deliverability issues if they forgot to set something up right or they missed a, a value. So some people will do the, the tilde like this. Now, remember what I talked about before, I have not set anything up previously, but I do have an SPF record already. So I'm gonna show you what to do to update one if you already have one. Most places, like most email providers will give you some sort of SPF record when you activate your domain with them. And so this one here, this is an SPF record from my domain. And because if I ever send an email from my domain, like an automated email, it will send it out from my website. I do have a service like that right now. So in here, I will just edit the record. We're gonna go in here and at the end of this IP address, I'm just going to paste in my include record for Google. So here's the thing, you can only have one SPF record listed for your domain. So this naming up here, the at symbol means that's for the root of your domain. So this one here, you can only have one SPF record, but inside of the SPF record, you can have up to 10 lookups. IP addresses do not count as lookups. These include are what the lookups are, but each of these domains could potentially have more than one what's called nested lookups inside of the, those actual domains. And so I can show you a little bit how to figure that out, another tool that we'll check in a little bit. But for right now, I'm gonna change that question mark. So the question mark is like kind of like a, a variable, right? It's just, it kind of questions it, like it's like, almost like a check, but it doesn't actually take any action. I'm going to change that to a hyphen just like I normally do because I want to make sure I keep that in line. I always set all of my TTL, my time to live to one hour. And that's just the time to live is basically like how long between checks does it take to recheck it? So like, let's say, for example, if you sent an email and then you sent another email from the same location, a lot of times, unless the actual like recipient was different, it may not check the SPF record again. And it also, it re-ups this record every hour. So what happens, let's say you make a change. Once you have this in one time, this one hour time to live means it does a recheck of this record every hour to validate if there's been any changes. So that's what's really cool. The initial time, the initial change may take 24 to 48 hours and some updates can still take that long, but this time to live kind of gives you a quicker way to get those rechecked. So we're, we are doing a little bit more technical stuff here. So keep in mind that some of this stuff, if, if it doesn't make sense, you know, that's okay. That's where we're here for questions. I'm sure, you know, I'm in the TLS group, so I can always help with questions in there as well too. 
But anyway, so we've updated the DCAM record, which same thing, you notice how we have this V equals DCAM and V equals SPF one. That's just the value, right? We're just saying, hey, this value is a DCAM record. This value is an SPF record. We're just identifying that's what these are. So we know we have the authentication and we know we have the SPF record. And in a lot of cases, people will just stop there because they say, hey, I did what they said I should do. But one of the big things that gets skipped is those DMARC records. People forget to put a DMARC record in their DNS settings because a lot of places don't tell them to do that. And so one of the things you'll notice if I come in here and say email authentication, right? And for this here, we have the DKIM authentication, we have spoofing and authentication, like people go searching in here and it doesn't really give an idea of what you should put in. It's just each of the values. But I will tell you that more and more, we're seeing more platforms say you should have not just SPF and DKIM, but also DMARC records. So over the years, I actually came up with the, well, I didn't come up with it, but I found a free tool that is probably one of the most powerful free tools for DMARC that I've ever seen. And I have yet to find anything that does the same thing for free. And so there's a tool out there called Postmark, but it's not just going to Postmark's website. They actually have an app called dmark.postmark app.com, which you can see I use it quite a bit. So it shows up on my list and I'm going to put this in here for you all. This is the joy of a workshop guys is you are getting all of the goodies right in the chat. This is why we made this for freaking, TLS members only. Freaking love free tools. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing I love about free tools is that as long as they keep them free, then it just continues to be a value add for just the overall community. And Active Campaign, which a lot of people probably recognize that name, they bought Postmark recently, I think. I think it was like last year. And they said, um, let's see, Coach Margin, have another meeting. Will the links be added? Uh, yes, I believe we'll, we'll be putting, making sure. Mark, I think you confirm that the links that I put in here will be the yeah, active, yeah. right? Yeah, all the links will be added. Robin is uh, copying them as as we got them and they'll be put in there for you guys. Perfect. Awesome. So you're all set, Margine. And so, so yeah, so Active Campaign put out an article when they bought Postmark and they said, hey, I, you know, we want to keep this tool free and Postmark, I don't want to say they were struggling, but I think there was a point that they said they were going to take away this free tool and Active Campaign when they snatched them up, they said, nope. We're going to keep that free because it's another thing that they can put out there as another value add. And there, there is a premium version of Postmark where they can actually, you know, give you monitoring and things like that. I even personally don't use them. I use just these reports because I'll tell you what, for what these reports do, it is absolutely amazing. And it's cool because they literally walk you through the process. They say, hey, what email address do you want to use to get this? And so I'm going to use the email address I have set up with my domain, which is support at shownetmarketing.com. And then I'm going to copy that same domain and put it in the send reports about this domain. And they tell you, right? They say your domain.com. It's kind of giving you an idea of what it should look like. So the cool thing about this is Postmark doesn't make you match those up. I have some clients that are like marketing agencies or PR firms or like uh, travel agents where they have like one guy, he's a, he's a regional director for a travel agency. And so he comes to me whenever he wants somebody new set up with a new domain, but he wants the reports because he doesn't want to make them have to deal with all that. So he's the one that handles that, make sure everything looks good. And then he reaches out to me when he sees problems. So you can actually send the reports to any email you want. I could send them all to my, my one email if I wanted to. So it's really about where do you want the report and about which domain. And here's what's so freaking cool about this. When you say get started for free, they actually build you a DMARC record. Technically, this record is ready to go. And when you just one click it, it highlights everything 
you can copy it. So I, I'm using keyboard, I'm using control C for copy and control V for paste. Um, on a Mac, it'd be command C, command B. You can also right click and copy however you wanna do it, whatever's best for you. But don't miss the little hidden text up here. It says, add this text record to your domain's DNS at, and then it says underscore dmark.shownertmarketing.com. This little guy right here, this underscore dmark, I have seen that be the missed record for almost every person who says, I have a DMARC record, but it's still not working. And they don't have underscore DMARC. They just put the at symbol for the root domain, or they typed in their root domain or whatever, or they put in just DMARC without the underscore. You have to have underscore DMARC in order for it to work. So I already copied that. We're going to go back over to our DNS. Like I said, we're going to be in DNS this whole time because we are literally setting these things up to tie directly to this domain. This isn't like a, you know, it could be wherever you're just, you know, adding these things in. You're literally tying this together. So I don't have a DMARC record here. And you can see here all of my text records down here. There's no DMARC record in here yet. So I'm going to put one in. So we're going to go add DNS record. Now, remember that name, underscore DMARC, D-M-A-R-C. I don't have to put in like the dot shown at marketing.com because most tools, most domain providers, you just basically put in the name and then they will fill in the rest. So I've seen some of them that won't tell you that there's already, like if I typed in dot shown at marketing.com, it'll remove it when I save it but some of them won't. So what I always do is say, just put in the first part that's before your domain and then they'll usually fill in the rest. And if it if you go see it later and it doesn't work, that's where you, know, you can double check with the domain provider and ask them how their naming convention is. But we know from reading the page, right? That this is a text record and I already have the content copied, but I'll show you again, one click on that little box it highlights everything, copy it out. And then we come back over here and then I paste it in. So now it's all there. Now I do a couple other updates because I like more security, more checks, more things to make sure everything's aligned. Technically, you don't have to do any of that. Technically, you could paste this in, change your time to live to one hour if you don't have a default or leave it as default. And I could save this right here and be done. But I'm gonna walk through a couple things on this one because I wanna make sure that everybody understands what each of these things mean within the DMARC policy, because this is the bread and butter of how you will look to the email providers, because you're telling the email providers, this is like, this is like your alignment policy. You're telling them, yes, I have an SPF. Yes, I have a DKIM. Here's the values and here's my policy that states what you should or shouldn't do if those values don't match up. And without this, they don't know. Like, and that's, that's the thing that I think bothered me the most when I first started really helping businesses with this is so many people just didn't know what a DMARC policy was. And if, the, if they didn't know, their email provider also has no idea because like, not that they don't know what a DMARC policy is, but they have no idea what to do with the emails because there's no DMARC policy. So if it fails SPF and DKIM, for example, they might just go, well, there's no policy against it. So we'll just kind of let it, the email do what it does. And they go, let it go into their algorithms and all their code and everything. And it just gets a jumbled mess. And this is where people, sometimes an email lands in spam and the very same email the next day could land in the inbox. Or sometimes it goes into promotions and sometimes it doesn't. The DMARC policy is the key. It tells the providers, this is what to look for. This is what to do if it's bad. And this is what you should be, you know, aligning to and sending reports to. And it is powerful. So just like we talked to the other ones, the V equals D mark one, that's just the value policy, right? That's just the, what the value means. That's the identifier. The next one is this P equals none. So P equals is the policy. This is the quote unquote domain policy, but we just call it P equals policy. So none means if the check fails, so the alignment check for SPF and DKIM, if it fails, do nothing, doesn't matter. Send it to the algorithm, let the algorithm do, do what it wants to do. There's technically three values you could have here. None just means 
do whatever you want. Then there's reject, which basically tells it, it's an encouragement. It's not a guarantee, but it's an encouragement to tell the email provider, you should probably not let this through because it didn't pass. Now, I personally don't use reject because this is kind of a kill it with fire option. Because sometimes, let's say for example, maybe you switch something up and you forgot to go through these records. Maybe you went to a new tool or you decided you wanted to, you know, update your DKIM records and it didn't go through the first time or you missed something or you had a typo, whatever the case may be, reject would encourage them to not let the email through, which means that your, your audience, your, your customers, clients, leads, whatever the case that you're working on, they just wouldn't get the email, period. But there's another policy that's a little less restrictive called quarantine. So quarantine is more like an encouragement to tell the email provider, hey, this didn't pass, but let it through, except only put it in spam. So that would be if you didn't have an SPF or you didn't have a DKIM, but you had a DMARC policy and you put it in, you know, sent it there, but it didn't actually pass that policy. So like if someone tried to spoof your email and send from like Outlook, for example, but you have Google Workspace, it's not gonna go through. DKIM's not gonna fire off because they don't have your value. They're never gonna guess that. SPF didn't fire off because it's not coming from Google. So now they're gonna have this quarantine policy that goes with every single email that your domain sends out, everything. Doesn't matter, a forward, a, a normal email reply, Anything that goes out, this policy will be checked every single time. And then they can go, oh, that didn't pass. We have a quarantine policy here. We should put this in spam. That is literally the number one thing that this is here for is to tell the email providers what to do. So when people say that DMARC is important, this is why. Because if it passes, it encourages the email provider to put it in the inbox because it knows you have a quarantine policy. And it's like, I think the last time I was talking to a Google rep, they said that DMARC policies now are like 25% of the, the weight of your deliverability. That's huge. That means that if you had everything else perfect, but no DMARC record, you, had, you would have a 25% chance of not getting your email delivered properly. That's a really, really big percentage in the email marketing world. So that's that policy there. The PCT is short for percentage. We're just basically telling it we want to check 100% of the emails that go through. The RUA tag is the reports tag. So that just basically says, hey, you're going to report this information over to, um, to this specific coded email, which is what Postmark gives you. So that way they're essentially getting a report on every email that goes through. And that report is how they build out the email reports every week that I'll be showing here in a minute. So there, uh, the postmark gives you another policy here that's SP. This is for subdomains. So I do recommend leaving this in there because if you ever use a subdomain for any reason, you already have it there and already set. You don't have to remember to go back and do it. It doesn't hurt you for having it there even if you don't have a subdomain policy. So. I always set this up as quarantine as well. And then at the end, we have this ASPF equals R. That stands for alignment for SPF. It's basically, that's the alignment check. I, I have an open ticket with Postmark because I'm trying to work with them to see if we can get this in there. But there's another record that you can put in for an alignment check and it's for DKIM. And it's literally just ADKIM. So for alignment for DKIM. And then I do the equals R and the R is just relaxed. What that means is that it's going to do a check and it's going to check it, you know, basically as an email goes through, but if it fails one, but not the other, it's going to still let it through. If you had these as strict, it would mean that it would have to like strict would mean that it would have to pass SPF every time to not go into quarantine. You don't want to do that because tools like get response, uh, act, active campaign, I think you know you have to have the enterprise plan for them as well. Like GetResponse, ActiveCampaign, AWeber, Constant Contact, they all have what's called a, um, a masked return path. So in order to have SPF pass for those tools, you would have to have a custom return path. Now we're getting into the weeds. I'm not going to go real deep into that. 
But there's other tools like MailerLite, or if you pay for like the enterprise plans for Git response or Active Campaign, you can get a custom return path. And all that means is that instead of it being like, so Active Campaign is active hosted, that's their technical return path. Instead of that, you could have it as your domain. But there's ways that you can set things up to still make it better. But strict would mean that every time you failed SPF, it would tell it tell the email provider to go into quarantine. So I always said it as relaxed. That's what Postmark recommends. That's what most other providers recommend. So I just leave it that way too. So this, this was the probably the deepest explanation that we have for this one, because it just really, this is the most important thing to tie everything together as a DMARC policy. So that is done. And now we have, we've set up DKIM. We've set up SPF, and now we've set up a DMARC policy. Technically, we could stop here, but we ain't done yet. <laughs> There's This is, like I said, we're going deep in this, just like we did with the first one. We're going deep in this one too. So this tool that I mentioned to you guys, MX Toolbox, they have a really cool thing about their with their tools that's also free. You know, Mark said, we love free tools. Well, when it comes to MX Toolbox, they are one of the coolest free email tools out there. I just went up and clicked tools on the top. When you go to mxtoolbox.com, by the way, and I'll just put it in here so you can see what it looks like. They actually give you a similar screen. They're just going to take you right to their tools because this is the thing that they pride themselves on of how people can actually do some lookups. So. You'll see across the top, there's all these different things like super tool, which is really cool. I'll show you that in a minute, but they have an MX lookup. They have blacklist. You can check if you're on a blacklist, but they have this other one all the way over here that says email health. Again, free tool, super powerful. And I can come in here and I can say, I want to look at the domain I just set up. So shownertmarketing.com. And I'm going to say, check email health. And now you can see it's checking for any problems in just the general sense, but it's looking at blacklists. It's looking at mail server. It's looking at web server. It's looking at DNS. It's doing an overall check on the entire domain to understand what is going on with this domain. And you can see it did give a few warnings, but I'm going to let everybody know here most of these like reverse DNS warnings or SOA expire value, anything that talks about reverse DNS or SOA expire, you could pretty much ignore. Number one, I've actually been on phone calls with Google about these SMTP errors right here. These reverse DNS does not match SMTP banner. They've actually explained to me why this happens and said that they're not planning on changing this. So anybody who uses Google Workspace and they go do this check, they're always gonna see those warnings. And the reason for it, if you look at these domains here, this is, again, we're getting into technical stuff. So people who aren't technical, this may be something that you just kind of overlook and say, Josh said this is good, so we're gonna move on. But for this, for people who are a little bit technical, this domain, google.com, is basically what the reverse DNS lookup would ideally go back to. However, when you send an email out, it comes from Google, but the reverse DNS lookup might be google-a.com, google-b.com, or it might say like, you know, rdns-a.google.com. Like they have different, so many different domains and they just have decided that they don't want to use the same return domain as what goes out. So the problem with that is, you get this error message that shows up. If it wasn't for me being the stubborn bullheaded person I am when it comes to tech stuff, I probably never would have figured this out. But when they explained it to me, then it made sense. So it's not a problem. It doesn't hurt deliverability. It doesn't hurt your emails going to spam or anything like that. It's just a warning that MX Toolbox says, because this is designed for people that are basically owning their entire system, but it's a really good tool to check for missing items or if you have too many lookups on an, on an SPF record, which I'm gonna demonstrate for you here in a minute. Um, but on, in my 
situation here, this would be good to go. If I was helping a client set up their deliverability and we ran this check and there was no errors, no blacklist, everything looked good like this, I would say good to go. Now, I just mentioned too many lookups with an SPF record. I'm going to walk through this and you guys are going to see what I'm talking about. I'm going to add a bunch of SPF records. And so bear with me here. Okay, so I know a lot of these by heart and that's only because I do this every single day. I help clients every day. That's one of my main fiber gigs, but I just added a whole bunch of SPF records in there. We're gonna see um, in MX Toolbox, when I go over here to this super tool, cause I could run this report again, but then it, it spits out everything. If you ever wanna check if your SPF record has too many lookups, you can literally come over to super tool in MX Toolbox it's going to reload the page and it's going to give this little drop down here. And all of these things are things that you can look up. Now, a lot of this stuff means nothing to most people, but you can go over here and I can do SPF record lookup. And then I can come in here and type in my domain and I'm going to do this look up here. So right now you can see that it has not updated yet. So we need to wait for that to update. So we'll come back to this, okay? So I just basically put that in there. We'll come back to that in a minute and we'll see what that looks like. And it should update and then show all those. So over here in DMARC, I just did a verification. It says, hey, everything's good. It tells you, you verified the record. A digest report will be sent to your email every Monday morning. Cool, no problem at all. So. I could add another domain if I wanted, but I'm actually going to show you what one of these looks like for my other domain. So give me one sec here. I'm going to pull it up and I just got to move this guy over. There we go. So you're not seeing what I'm doing yet because I want to pull up the email. So that way I can show you what it looks like instead of just blasting all of my random emails on the screen because you guys would be overwhelmed. <laughs> All right, let's get this. There's always those things that you, you tell yourself you're gonna have ready for people when you do these things and then you just forget. <laughs> All right, so where is my DMARC weekly digest? There we go. All right, so I'm gonna bring this up for you and that way you can see it. So this is an example of what a DMARC weekly digest will look like. And so this is the one that I got. It's actually in my trash because I looked at it and deleted it. And this is because I was, wasn't thinking about today, but I will show you. So here you can see it shows how many emails were processed, how many of them were SPF or DQM aligned. So remember we talked about that, right? You had the ASPF record and the ADKIM record and we are checking one or the other, right? We're not being strict on both of them to say both have to pass. We're saying one or the other because there are some tools that just won't actually pass SPF. And then I had a 0%, you know, that if they're both not aligned. And then it says here, your current DMARC policy for jkshonert.com is set to quarantine 100% of emails that fail SPF and DKIM alignment. So. Now we get to go down to the sources. So here we've got ML Send, which is MailerLite. That's my main marketing tool that I use. And you can see I've sent out a good number of emails from there. And then I have Google, which is my, Google, my provider, my email provider, Google Workspace. And I send emails back and forth from there. And you'll notice something interesting, right? Is see how Google has these that maybe weren't always SPF aligned, or there's this one down here that was 50% or 66% here. So Google does this thing where they rotate IP addresses. And sometimes if you catch it at the wrong time and their, uh, their records didn't pass over properly, sometimes that will happen. But you'll notice at the top when I came up here, it said 100% of my emails were SPF or DKIM aligned. So you kind of think, well, why is that? If we got records like this that are low, why did it still say 100%? Well, that's because out of those 
80 emails, 95% of them actually showed decon alignment and all the other ones did too. So that's where the either or comes in. The 5% here that weren't aligned on DKIM probably were aligned on SPF. So that's why we say one or the other, because you want to have good deliverability and you can't have good deliverability if you're being too strict. Now, remember I talked about that return path deal where if you don't have a custom return path, your SPF will fail. Well, here's a good example of that. GR mail one, which is get response mail, SPF alignment is zero down the board. Now I don't send a lot with Git response anymore. I have a couple automations in there, but that's mostly because I'm moving everything over to MailerLite. So, but 100% DKIM alignment because I have my email authenticated with Git response. However, that lack of custom return path means that I'm actually sending emails from gr you know gr hyphen mail onecom on behalf of my domain because I don't have an enterprise plan. I'm not, not big enough for that yet. Don't need to spend $500 a month or whatever it is they want for those. So Google will, or uh, Get Response will not send me the ability to have a custom return path. So you just kind of got to live with it. This is another reason why having one or the other pass is really important because then you can actually use tools like this and still be considered a good sender because you're still at least doing your DKIM authentication. And then I have other things down here like forwarded email sources. So these are things where like if I sent someone an email and they had a redirect or they had a forward and a lot of people get kind of really shifty about that because they said, well, I don't, I don't want someone to forward my email and then it makes it look like it's me sending on behalf of someone else. No, that's not the case. Whenever you have an email that gets redirected or someone forwards it, your DKIM alignment will still pass through because they're not acting as you. They're just forwarding your email. Even if they reply to your email and like reply to it and add somebody else, they're not sending on behalf of you. They're sending on behalf of them, but your DKIM alignment still passes through because the original email came from you. And that's where the big tricky part comes in is this is where we want to make sure DKIM is set up Number one, that's the most important one because then every single server, you can see here, registrar servers, 1E100, secure server, me.com, all of these different places have all identified, yep, that first email still came from jkshoner.com. And then that's the end of the report. And so what's really good about this report is it allows you to identify areas that are maybe problem areas. So maybe you forgot about a tool that sends one email a month, or you forgot about, you know, setting up SPF on one of your tools or DCAM on one of your tools. This report will tell you because it does check. I mean, you can see I send emails from three different places during the week, and it knows I sent from those three places during the week. This is how smart email alg algorithms are. They know where you're actually sending emails from, and they're checking. They're watching every single email. So this is why this stuff is super important. So I'm gonna move that back off the screen. How's everybody doing? Everybody still going good? Thumbs up? Yeah, man, this is incredible <laughs> stuff. I just got, uh, Robin and I were going back and forth. He's like, he's actually a really good trainer. <laughs> oh, thank you guys. I appreciate stuff, that. Man. This is really That's good. Awesome. Keep it up, man. Thanks for, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the, the yes in the chat. I love that. What was that four exclamation points? I'll take it. Yeah. So, okay. So let's, let's do go back and let's check and see if my SPF record is actually set up. So let's see if that picked it up. Boom. There we go. Okay. So now we can see, we've got all these different records here, right? And we see that it's all, all these, this is super stuff. Thanks Stu. So we've got Google in here. We've got MailerLite. We've got SendGrid. We've got Outlook. I mean, and I don't even use Outlook, but I put it in there. And so right now it says, oh, see, look at this. I might not even had it enough in here to, to trigger it. It said number of lookups is okay. All right, let's see. So this is, remember I told, I said earlier, there's a tool that I use to check how many lookups there are. So another free tool guys, easydmark.com. So this is another one that I use when I need to look up how many lookups are, have, are showing up in a, like a, an SPF record, for example. So I can type in the, t the scan domain here and just do it that way. But what I like doing is up here, if you hover over platform, it kind of comes down and does this 
SPF record check and lookup. I like going directly to that because I'm just checking for this. I want to see how many lookups there are. I might have actually hit just 10. So 10 is the limit, by the way. 10 lookups total minus your, your like your IP addresses don't count as a lookup. But so if we go here and we say shonermarketing.com, check SPF. Oh, eight lookups. Okay. So, so here we go. We have eight lookups in here, three main, five nested. So what this means, right, is, so here's the IP address that was here for Google. And then they just have their lookup here. That was just the IP. But then we have this, uh, if we go down here, the nested ones. So like the main ones right here, ML send. So this is for MailerLite. So uh, send grid only had one look up. Okay. So there's a couple different ones. Let me grab, let me see if we can trigger this. Cause I want to show you guys what that looks like. And so let me do another one where you can put records in here called A or MX. So A records goes against like your A records in the domain. And then MX goes against your MX records. So this will automatically, I, this, this will kill it. I, I just know that I'm going to take, I'm going to, I think this one, I think the underscore for the SPF doesn't get included with that. Okay. So while that's updating again, we're going to go back over here to this easy D mark, because I want to show you something really cool about easy D mark. So something that you'll notice right away, right? They have this SPF lookup and then they have this SPF generator. Okay. So this is something really, really cool is if you don't know really how to build an SPF record and you can't remember all the different terms and everything, well, guess what? You don't need to. So right now I actually have it setting up and it says, Hey, here's all the records that are in here. But let's say I wanted to take out the IP address. I wanted to, um, you know, take off some of these other ones, or maybe I want to add like, um, there's another one that is, uh, el, it's like elserver.com or something like that. There's a couple different ones, right? And so I can come through and I can say, hey, this looks you know pretty good. And I want to change it, change it to neutral, which is like the, the question mark one. And then maybe, you know, I want to do the MX records. And you put in your domain and what it's going to look like. What's cool about these this generator is it knows all of these different records and where to put it. And when I hit generate, so notice here, it told me invalid SPF. Why? Because it says missing all tag, which equals to question mark all need to use hyphen all or, you know, the little tilde all for maximum security. So it tells you like, hey, by the way, you should probably do this. And I said, okay, no problem. So I go back here, change it to fail. And then I'm going to, so notice now we say 10 lookups, right? Five main, five nested. I'm going to hit the A record and we're going to generate that one again. And boom, there we go. 11 lookups. Bold red text says DNS lookups count 11 exceeds maximum limit of 10, which, were, which will result in what's called a perm error. So perm error is a permanent error or perma error. And basically it will fail the SPF check. This is exactly what you got to watch out for. If you're using a ton of different tools, you have to watch out for the number of records that you are looking up in your SPF record because this will fail. And then if this fails because of maximum lookup, this perm error basically will reject your email from sending out. So you won't even, you won't even land in spam. It just won't send at all because it can't validate the SPF record at all, it's a, it's failing on that front. So this is a good indication of this is what happens. And you notice this MX record, look at all the records it pulled up. And then the A record ended up looking up my IP address that I have tied to, to the actual domain. So it's looking up all these things. Now, if I take those two off and regenerate that record, look what happens. We drop those two lookups. So the, the MX and the A record goes away. And now we just have Google. So, so the, the lookups it's doing, right? This nested. So it shows the one and then it says net blocks in here. So net blocks one, net blocks two, net blocks three. And then we keep scrolling. Then we get to the next lookup and it tells you which ones they are. So here's what's really cool about that too. Remember what I said before is that IP addresses don't count as a lookup. Well, what if you wanted to 
take away some of your lookup. So like, let's say for example, for Google, I probably wouldn't do it for Google because look at all of these IP addresses they have listed. That would just be nuts. But if you wanted, like, let's say you were at 11, you needed to get to 10. Well, I could come down to MailerLite and say like, oh, look, MailerLite only has two IP ranges. Well, I could add that in my SPF record. So here's where EasyDMARC is super powerful. Again, free tool, a free tool that literally has this much power to generate this stuff is I could say, instead of ML send, I want to use, I still want to validate against my MX records just for extra security. It's not required by the way, but you still, still want to do that. But I could go in here and turn those back on. I could take out ML send and those IP addresses that I copied, I can put those in this IP4. The only thing you got to make sure you do is take out the beginning parts, the IP4 part. But now watch this. If I generate this record, I'm now at nine lookups instead of 11 like it was before because I took out the actual server lookup and I used the IP address. So this is where if you're using a whole bunch of tools, I used to have to do this. I had five tools I was using at one point because I was testing a whole bunch of different tools and I didn't want to land in spam. This was back in, uh, I think it was February or March that I started testing different tools because personally, I started not liking the way that Git response was doing the whole SPF record thing. And I wanted a tool that could I could, I could have a custom return path and MailerLite was one of them. So this is what I had to do. I had so many of these IP records because I would come in here, I would do the lookup, I would find the IP record for that tool and then put that in instead of their domain. And I could still go have my record the way it's set. So this tool is so powerful. Absolutely keep this in your toolbox of things that you want to be able to use because you can do the lookups and you can do the generator. They even have a raw checker. So what this does is this goes in and you know you can basically put in the record that you have and just do a validation. And right here, you can see it actually looked it up for me, but I'm going to go turn all that stuff. I'm going to change it back the way it was before because I don't need all those things. So we're going to take off all of these at the end and leave it the way I had it. And make sure, check your spaces too. Make sure you don't have double spaces that will also cause it to fail. So it's a lot of information. We're almost done, but I wanna show you one more thing because it's super, super powerful. And I wanna show you how to read it and how to use it. And that's uh, Google Postmaster. And, and I'm sorry, one last thing about DMARC, the easy DMARC is they have those generators for DMARC policies, for SPF, for DKIM. So if you have maybe a, uh, a tool that doesn't have a DKIM generator in the tool, but you reach out to their support and they said, hey, use this query or use this key, you could actually come into this generator, put in your domain, put in the selector. So for example, I could, you know, you could go through and say like the selector could be SM for show at marketing and you can put whatever size you want. I've yet to see places that are using 4096, but 1024, I usually use 2048 and check this out. It generates a private key for you. So that's where you can kind of go through and you can set up, you know, this selector. But generally this is something that you have to work, work out, work, excuse me, reach out to the company and work with them to get this identified and they'll usually do this for you. So if you can't find a generator within whatever tool you're using, just reach out to their support, ask them, say, hey, do you have a DKIM record I can use? Or can I give you a DKIM record and you align it to my account? Hopefully they'll, you know, I put it this way. If you have a tool that you're using that doesn't allow you to authenticate, stop using that tool because it's probably gonna hurt you more than it's gonna help you. So last tool we're gonna go through today because really, I mean, this is really what we did, right? We'll recap, we, we set up the DKIM record we set up the SPF record, we set up the DMARC policy. That's really the things that you need to worry about. Like I said, I, I would walk through doing a, a, a BIMI record. Um, if you are going to set up a BIMI record, just come to Easy DMARC, go over to this BIMI record generator. They actually walk you through the process. They say, you know, they tell you what it is, they tell you why you need it, they show you how to implement it. 
I've helped a couple people actually put this through and get this to work. But here's the things that they tell you, right? Is that you have to have a trademarked logo. So it says like, here, enter your SVG, SVG logos URL, that kind of stuff. But I will tell you, you have to have it trademarked and you have to have this certificate. It's called a VMC. And basically what that means is that you own that logo and it'll show up on like the little bubble next to your name on all the email platforms. That's really what that's for. It does, it can help with deliverability. And I do plan on having this done in the future. But what I've heard is sometimes it can take up to a year, maybe even longer to get an actual logo trademarked for your company. So don't stress on this. If you see somebody telling you need a BIMI record and you don't have all those things in place, don't, don't think it's going to break the system if you don't have it. So I just want to get rid of that misconception right away. So last tool we're going to go through is Postmaster. This is probably my favorite tool of everything because like it's my favorite tool to track my domains. Now you can see, I don't have the Shonert marketing domain in here yet, because like I said, I purposely didn't do it because I wanted to add it here for you guys. So when you come to this page and you don't have any of these on here, basically what you can do is you can come into this little plus down here. Sometimes they'll even prompt you to do it. You have to have a Google account signed in. This is just a free account that I use that I kind of use for my monitoring and everything because I have multiple different domains and things like that that I monitor. But you can use any Google account you have and it has to be a Google account. And then I'm just going to put the domain in here. So shonermarketing.com. And when I hit next, it's going to give me a record to put in. So this is a Google site verification record. Now, if you look down here, I actually have a Google site verification record, but it's not the same because when I set up my domain on Google Workspace, I had to verify for Google Workspace. That verification does not work for Postmaster. So you're gonna to have to get a new one. So I'm gonna come in here. You don't have to put anything specific, just do the root of your domain. We're gonna select a text record. I'm gonna paste that content in there just the way they gave it to me. Select my time to live, which I always choose an hour. Hit add DNS. And this is what I love about most domain providers. I did that and now I go back to Postmaster, hit verify and it's already there, right? I'm not waiting 48 hours for them to have it show up. Now here's the kicker about Postmaster. They need to read data to be able to get you some reports. So when I go in here, I'm not gonna have anything in here. It's just gonna say, no data to display, please come back later. But I got you because I have my main domain that is here. And I'm gonna show you the last 90 days of my email sending to show you kind of what good email sending Jenner is gonna look like. Now, I'm gonna give you some disclaimers. Number one, in no way am I going to shame anybody for having spam reports and nobody should shame anybody else for having spam reports. You're a marketer. You're gonna get haters. You're gonna get people that didn't think they signed up for your list. You're gonna get people that signed up and then a week later remember you know didn't remember who you are and got your email and went who the heck is this and they're going to mark you with spam <laughs> mark says i got a spam complaint today it just happens i i've had people that have marked me as spam and then emailed me and said oh shoot i forgot who you were so i marked you as spam can you take me uh, can you take yourself out of spam i said no i can't you did it you got to take me out of spam it is the silliest thing but don't be afraid by seeing spam complaints like this. If you're doing good marketing, you should probably expect it because good marketing means you're getting people to stop and open your emails and then they read it and go, I don't want this. And they market as spam instead of just deleting it or unsubscribing. I'd rather people unsubscribe. Like you don't want to be on my list. Just hit that button, but that's not what people do. So this first section is about user reported spam rate. They even say it right here. This means that someone clicked the button in Gmail that said spam or mark as spam or report spam, whatever the button says. Now, Google Postmaster is for Google emails. Last time I checked, over 60% of my list is Gmail. 
whether it's Google Workspace or free Gmail. That's huge. Another, I think the other 20% is Outlook, 10% Yahoo, and then it's all like the Zoho, Proton, all the other weird ones. But if over 60% of your emails are Google, they're going to be your heaviest weight to understand how your domain is doing and how your emails are doing. Generally, what I tell people, if you can stay under a 5% spam rate, you're doing great. So right here, you can see I'm under a percent most of the time, maybe a percent and a half, but most of it, my emails I send out, I'm getting very little spam complaints. Recently, like this is how it looks right now because I've been getting some new leads coming in. And so people are generally gonna do that. But I'm gonna show you 120 days because I'm gonna show you like, this just shows you, I'm constantly marketing. I'm constantly bringing new people in. This isn't to tote my horn, it's just to show you, this is what a list is going to look like. If you're not seeing some sort of this, either you're not emailing enough or you're not being grabby enough with your headlines, your subject lines to get them to open the emails or notice your email. So this just goes to show that you're being noticed. But I'm going to go back to 90 days because that's just a little easier to look at. So spam rate, user generated spam rate, nothing to be worried about. It happens to everybody. Just look at it, make sure it's not egregious and move on. If you find one that spikes where it's like really, really super high, like over 5%, go back and check the email you sent out that day and find out maybe what's spammy about it. That's, that's how I can tell if I sent a, an email that maybe wasn't as good, then that's what I would do is I would go back and check that. Get a drink of water here. So next one. You can have all these different things here. We'll try to get through them as, as quick as we can here. IP reputation. Now you're going to see mine and you're going to see it's all yellow. Yellow is not bad. So these are just the IP addresses. It says medium. You want to see this as medium or high. In the terms of deliverability, especially with Google Postmaster, medium is okay. That's them saying, you know what? We trust you but you're still kind of edgy. So we're just gonna, we're, we're gonna give you the slap every now and then and maybe throw you into spam once in a while. They don't do it to like prove a point. It's just every now and then you might send something that's a little dicey. That's okay. I've, I've been placed in spam before. Mark, I know you've had some that go into spam every now and then you get a little, little overzealous. Sometimes you're like, wow, that didn't get a great open rate. And someone's like, yeah, with my spam, it, it happens. I've so. actually heard too, just so you know, uh, I've heard this, maybe you can validate it too, but where one spam complaint for every thousand emails is acceptable. So like if you send an email out to 5,000 people, five spam complaints is, you know, that's a general, I don't know how true it is, but that's sure. what I've kind of gone with. I think I heard that from, you know, an email autoresponder service at one point, but. Um, yeah, they've kind of gone more in percentages nowadays. So they'll say like, you know, it used to be like 0.1% spam complaints was like the threshold, but I think they've loosened their reins a little bit on that because most email autoresponders now, like a good example is like MailerLite. They say, I think they say something like 0.5% or 1%, yeah. something like that. Yeah. But it's, it's really, think about it, not necessarily each email you send, it's overall. And they're looking for more along the lines of, you know, are you sending a lot of stuff that's, that's constantly getting spam yeah. complaints? You know, so I would say as long as you're staying, saying, staying under 5%, just in general, you're probably going to be safe. I would aim for obviously as close to zero as possible for spam complaints. But and, if, and one thing too, to point out that, and, and how to really make sure you avoid as you know, spam complaints is make sure that you're emailing people on the topics that they signed up to your list in the first place for. So if yeah. people signed up to your list to learn about dogs, don't be emailing them about cats. You see what I mean? So yep. the key is staying in line with the ideas of why they subscribed in the first place. Right. Well, and that's kind of like my list. I do a lot of value on my list. I don't, I don't send a lot of promotions because I use my email list as a way to build relationships, build rapport. So when I do a promotion, people aren't like, oh, this guy just always wants me to buy stuff. 
Now, some people are more along the lines of promotion after promotion. Other people are more like, like I love what I love about Mark's emails. Mark is always like, hey, do you want to get better at video? Here's this video I did about video. Do you want to get better at blogging? Here's this video I did about blogging. Like there's always these things of like, do you want this? Here's what I did for you. A lot of mine lately have been stories because I've been building my brand up really heavily about you know, my, my journey into freedom and being able to be a full-time business owner and all this stuff. And that's the kind of thing that people that join my list, they're getting digital marketing tips and things like that. They're getting mindset tips. They're getting ways to help them build their business because my, my mission is helping solopreneurs and small business owners, you know, grow and scale and build their business and get towards freedom. So that's what I've built my brand around. For Mark, his brand is more around like, hey, I'm the video and email marketing guy. Like, that's what I do. So all of his emails are about video and email marketing, basically. So great point, Mark, right? Like, give them what they signed up for. If you are a travel agent and someone signs up for you to get travel agent tips and tricks and information, don't send them a make money online biz up. They're just going to mark you as spam and probably even report you too. Same thing if you're trying to get people to sign up for your list because you want to teach them how to be a coach. Don't send them information about how to be an agency. Like that's just the kind of thing is you don't want to confuse people. So IP reputation, not much to say about that. You can click on data points too, and it'll tell you what IP address was sent. So I know like most of these are all um, like, Mailer Light IPs because I send most of my emails through Mailer Light. Sometimes I'll see like a Google one pop in here, but um, the other one, so domain reputation, this is one that I've been very blessed to have a high domain reputation for my domain for a while. And it's been almost a year now that I've been seeing it listed as high. If you can get your domain reputation to high reputation, you are basically you're better than probably 95% of emails, like email marketers out there. Most people kind of hover around this medium range. And I, I actually have gone up and down in the past. I would go up and down between medium and high and even sometimes dip down to low. I personally have never gotten down to bad, even when I first started and didn't know what I was doing. But if you can stick at medium, medium to high, that's going to be a good spot. And here's what's interesting is, People say, oh, this is the reputation of my domain. I got it. Not exactly. They don't word this properly. But what this is, is this is actually the reputation of your emails. So what they're doing is they're aligning the reputation of your emails and how like the good emails that you might send, they're lining that up with your domain. So they're saying, hey, this domain typically sends good emails. They're not getting a lot of spam complaints. They're not sending out a lot of links and a lot of heavy formatting. It's not stuff that's getting, you know, lost in translation. It's basically just, they know that you're sending good emails. If you can get to that point where you can see this bar sit high all the time, you're very likely going to see yourself land in the inbox almost every time. It's very rare that they will put you in spam without someone clicking mark as spam. Medium, you'll probably land in spam every now and then. Not a big deal. It happens. But they just basically have identified that every now and then you might send something that's a little dicey. It's fine. If you get to low, that's them saying, hey, you probably aren't sending great emails. Your, your stuff is getting flagged for spam. People are marking you as spam a lot. And then bad would basically be they've identified you as a bad sender and bad emails, and you're going to go to spam pretty much every time. I'm working with a couple of clients right now that um, just, it's funny, coincidentally, both of them on the same day went from bad to low because we've been working on getting them to send to you know, better emails. The other thing that this is for too is engagement. Your engagement on your emails is extremely important. Opens and clicks. And actually now as of, I think it was June when Google updated their algorithm for emails, read time. So if you're helping a friend out by reading their emails, don't just open it and, and delete it. Read time is important, just like watch time and videos. I don't know the exact number if there's like a, a, a you know good number for it, but basically if it's a longer email, just give yourself some time. I mean, even if you skim it, 
give yourself some time to actually scroll through that email if you want them to be seen as a good sender, because that is a, a huge thing is that if somebody opens your email and immediately deletes it every time, eventually your domain reputation is going to go down. So keep that in mind. And I think I just heard my uh, basement door open. So I might have my little one come down here shortly. Um, it's bedtime. <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, feedback loop, this one, you should pretty much not see this go anywhere. It, feedback loop spam rate. This is basically the, um, if you had an I like a, an email that was identified, like it was flagged as spam. So it says across flag identifiers. And if you look at this help article, if it'll load up here, Oh, great. They're not loading their help article today. Cool. Thanks, Google. Um, so anyways, the uh, the spam rate here is it basically if Google identified you as spam, then we'll go ahead, you know, they'll bring this up and do that. So I'm going to give my son a hug here quick. Come here, dude. Yes, I know you're being silly behind the chair. Come here. One second. I'll be right back. That's what it's all about right there, family. <laughs> Guys, this is really, really good stuff. I know this is, you know, um, this is, you know, can be very technical, but Josh has done a phenomenal job at really explaining this and really, you know, showing you how to put this into practice. So, you know, you're going to have access to this recording in order to really, you know, take advantage of it. But I'll tell you what, this is some top level training that you're getting people literally pay thousands and thousands of dollars to know this information this is this is some of the things that just is widely not taught um and uh, that's what i love about it we're going to have this inside of tls so that you can refer to it this is all about making sure you get the best benefit from email marketing that's really what it's about oh yeah absolutely and and actually Here's, here's what's interesting, right? Is what you said earlier too, before you talked about that. One of the reasons I love being able to work from home, you know, and not just like, I don't I actually, <laughs> I didn't want to talk about this much, but just as of last week, I actually don't have a day job anymore. I'm full-time in my business as of last week. So, awesome. um, but that's one of the joys of being able to do this is I, I will every moment of every day, I will take the two minutes it takes or three or five minutes, whatever, to say goodnight to my kids when they come down and all that kind of stuff, because that's just what it's about, right? When we're looking at building businesses, that's why we do this stuff, right? We're, we're all building businesses. We're all aiming towards freedom. And this is the kind of stuff I love doing these trainings. I love being able to help people learn because I want you to be able to experience that level of freedom, to be able to have the choices to do what you want to do. That's what this is all about. This isn't about just doing these things because you got to know it. I mean, that's true, but it's all about the end result that you're getting by setting this up. Because if you can get into more people's inboxes, you get to make more sales, you get to build more relationships. And this email marketing, just so you can understand how powerful this is, this is how I was able to leave my job because I gained the influence of people that were watching my emails and it landed me a couple of really, really nice contracts. And it just, it happened so fast because follow these things over time and it's just amazing. So I'm not gonna get on the soapbox about that. I just wanted to put that out there that it's not just about knowing these things so you know them, it's about knowing these things so you can be more effective and more efficient with your business so you're not constantly beating your head against the wall to try to get into people's inbox and try to figure out what's going on. Like when you have a problem, this is why we're going through Google Postmaster so deep because you got to know what you're looking for so you can identify these problems. That's why those free re reports from Postmark are so key. So you can identify where there's areas where you maybe don't have something set up properly and you can actually say, Oh, I need, I forgot about that app. I need to go do that. That's why all this stuff is so important. And so, um, we got through feedback loop. That's the being marked as spam by the email provider. So authentication, this is one thing you're going to notice. I actually have a hundred percent authentication over the last 90 days. 
I am so grateful that I found Mailer Light because of that reason. Now, I'm not here to tote Mailer Light. I'm not giving you an affiliate link for it right now. If somebody wants to know about it or if Mark decides he wants to put that out there as a potential option for people, that's Mark's choice. But I will tell you right now, if you can find a tool that gives you a custom return path, that's going to be a ticket to give you better deliverability because I'm getting 100% success rate across DKIM, SPF, and DMARC because of that. Now, if you don't have 100% success rate on SPF, is it going to kill you? No, it's not. Almost every autoresponder out there that I know of, they either charge you an arm and a leg to get custom return path, or they just don't offer it at all. And they still have decent deliverability. And there are places out there that you can kind of track some of that stuff. There is a place called, uh, I'm going to put it in here, the link, emailtooltester.com. And, and actually, I'm just going to make sure I remember that properly because I want to make sure tool, yeah, emailtooltester.com. So this is a place if you want to learn about all of the different like main autoresponders, they actually go through and they have all of these big ones that they've done like real deep reviews on. I've got a couple reviews on mine as well on my YouTube channel. But I mean, this is where I go when I want to check things like, you know, who's doing what side by side comparisons, things like that. But they also every six months, they do an actual uh, test where they'll go deep into all of the deliverability. And that's how I found MailerLite because I've been following these guys for years and they MailerLite has been showing up the top of the list. So that's why I did that has nothing to do with the usability of Git response or anything like that. Git response is still an amazing tool. Their automation is amazing. But same thing with like Active Campaign and Aweber, all of, all of them are great tools. Um, but anyway, so authenticated traffic, if you can get them all to 100%, great. If you can at least get DKIM and DMARC to 100%, that's going to help you out greatly. If you start seeing things kind of go up and down and failing, you got to start kind of identifying where they're coming from. If it's, you know, that's where the DMARC reports that you get weekly from Postmark, that's why those are so powerful. So... Last couple here, encryption. This one should pretty much be 100% all the time. It said, talks about TLS. TLS is a basically an encryption platform that's used. This is generally handled by either- No, no, no. That's Google's endorsement of TLS insiders. Let's just- <laughs> I was like, wait, what? <laughs> no. Just kidding. Yeah, there you go. Uh, inbound TLS rate, 100%. Everybody goes into TLS. Yeah, exactly. Um, no. So yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that could be an interesting kind of play on words there, Mark. That could be a good yeah. marketing tactic. Well, there you go. Um, but yeah, so basically this is not something that you have control over, but the email providers and the domain providers are the ones that handle this. So if you end up seeing this having problems, first place you should go is whoever provides your email account. So in my case, it'd be Google. Some cases it's Microsoft, some it's the Zoho, whatever the case may be, just reach out to them first and say, hey, I've started noticing this. Is this something that's a problem? In the past, I've seen mine dip for a day and come back up. And that could be that they were updating something or their systems were not working right for a day. If you see it dip once, probably not a big deal. If you see it dipping a lot, that's where I would absolutely go check with your email provider. Most people that are using big providers like the big autoresponders, like GetResponse, MailerLite, Aweber, or like Google or Microsoft email providers, they're probably, you're probably never going to see a problem. But if you're using maybe your own server for doing email, that's where you could see some issues. And this is what people use to identify those problems. And then the last one is delivery errors. Now, thankfully, I don't have a problem with that. I've, I've almost, I think I had one time ever where I had one email that didn't get delivered. And it was because I had, um, oh, what was the reason I got to remember? This was like years ago, but I had a delivery issue where I had an email get rejected for some reason. And when you click on the data points, like right here, it says no delivery errors. Like even for like, we'll do a recent one, right? No delivery errors for, uh, for August 30th, but it'll show you the reason down below. So some people may see where it says like, um, it'll say rate limit exceeded 
or it will say, you know, something along the lines of like uh, spam. You know, there's one that called spam limit. So like if you uh, hit like a, a certain number of emails that got marked as spam, then it'll stop delivering emails. Like there's other reasons, but generally you shouldn't see much of a problem here as long as you're sending good emails. But if you're sending too many directly from your email account, I think for Google is if you send more than 500 in a day directly from your email account, they'll actually you know, do the whole rate limit exceeded. And it, it just, all it means is that you just did too much at once, but from, from autoresponders doesn't matter, right? Because you're not sending from Google, you're sending from the autoresponder using your Google domain or whatever domain that you're using. So, so that's the postmaster. And that's again, another free tool. And I'll put that in here for you guys as well is postmaster.google.com. And all of these tools, while I personally believe if you want to understand your deliverability and you want to be able to track this stuff and, you know, I'm a firm believer and I, and, and maybe Mark, you might know who said this, but it says what you don't track doesn't improve. Um, do I don't know who who's... said that, but that is absolutely true. Right. Um, there's no doubt about it. So if you want something to improve, you have to track it. You have to understand what's going on in the background you have to be able to get these things to work. And if you don't know what's broken, you can't fix it. So that's why all these tools are, are great. That's why, you know, the postmark having these reports here are great. That's why having MX toolbox. So like now we updated the SPF record. So it should go back to the way it looked before. And, uh, oh, it looks like they haven't updated yet. So it might take a while for that to go back, but like, that's the thing is all having all of these things, you know, you can come in here and look at DMARC records. If you want to, you know, figure out what your DMARC looks like. And if it's, you know, if you're passing all of the checks and everything, all of these things are super, super great ways to identify problems, fix problems and setting up your email authentication the right way. The first time it's a one and done. Once it's set up, if you don't change anything, you don't change the tools you're using, you don't change any of the providers you've got going on and everything's just the way it's been from day one, you never have to come back in and fix these again. They're done, that's it. So it's getting them done the first time, ideally before you start sending a lot of emails, but if you've already been sending emails, there's never, it's never too late to make it better. And so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because that's basically what I wanted to show for the workshop. And then I'm going to bring my video back on. And so again, another, another long one, because we went deep, deep, deep again today, but I'll tell you what this I, I'm, I so am thankful, Mark, that you gave me the opportunity to yeah. get in here and, you know, help out the TLS members and do this for them. Because I firmly believe that, like you said, not enough people are teaching this not enough people are really making a point to show people this is how you properly set up your email. I'm pretty system. well connected to a lot of top market. Nobody talks about this. This is why yeah. like I've been kind of on the search for someone who really knows this to teach it. Even someone I've outsourced to in the past <laughs> who is pretty good. And Angie reached out to me, what, maybe a month ago? Something like that. Yeah, a month, yeah, month and, and a half. She, and she's like, you really need to get Josh out. Like he's like the whiz on email deliverability. I'm like, that's exactly what I need. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm glad we did. And yeah, uh, it's been really phenomenal. So um, I know we went a little longer. So a lot of people have dropped off because some of them had to go, but yeah. this, this training will be, you know, in the back office for a long time. And um, you know, this will be something we're definitely, again, I want to reiterate too here that, um, we'll put Josh's information. If you want to reach out to him, his email, um, if, if you feel like this is a little, I mean, he, he laid it all out. If you just follow what he says, you can do it on your own. But if you just feel like, you know what, I'd rather let him figure it out, you know, get in touch with him. You can hire him to, to do it for you and, uh, have him do it and just, yeah. And I'd be happy to, and, and just so everybody knows, like, I'm not going to talk about prices on here, but I don't charge an arm and a leg. I don't charge thousands of dollars to do this. Um, I don't believe that this is something, I mean, to be completely honest, it took what an hour and a half to go through all of it. And that was explaining every little piece of it all. Yeah. You could probably imagine someone like me that's been doing this forever 
I mean, this is something that will end up being that I can get it done in 20, 30 minutes tops. Yeah. I mean, I just had a client I worked with earlier today. He had four domains to set up and it took us just under an hour. Yeah. So, you know, and that's what I, I generally charge by domain if we're going to do it that way. But, you know, either way, I'm happy to do it because I know that there's people out there like I'm a firm believer on you pay people to do the things you don't want to do or that you don't know how to do. Right. And don't stress yourself on things that you think like, oh, I got to figure this out. If you've got, you know, a couple extra bucks sitting around, let's figure that out and let's get it done for you. Yep, absolutely. Well, cool. Awesome. Um, really appreciate it, Josh. We'll wrap yeah. this up. Um, any other, any questions? There's only a couple of you guys on left, but uh, if not, we're just gonna, we're gonna drop this and let, let Josh go enjoy the rest of his night with his family. And I'm going to oh, go yeah. with mine right after yeah, the last episode of stranger things is calling my name. <laughs> Hey man, next week, uh, Cobra Kai season five comes out. I'm stuck. I saw that. I, <laughs> I am really looking forward to that. That's been a great, great series so far. Yep. Yep. Um, he says, so Stu just asked, do you work with clients that have active campaign? hundred yeah. percent. Um, I actually don't, I don't discriminate against, uh, I may, I'm a equal opportunity email provider. <laughs> um, no, I, I work with so many different platforms. And so it doesn't matter what you use. I can probably figure it out. And I don't shy away from anything like that. So Stu, to answer your question, 100%. Active campaign is actually one of the biggest ones that I work with. Um, but I, I use Get Response and MailerLite myself. But I mean, people use so many different ones. I've, I've been learning that there is a lot of different providers out there, a ton. some that I've yep. never heard of. Yep. So it's kind of cool. A ton. Yep. Good awesome. deal. All right, guys. Well, have a great night, Josh. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank and, you everybody uh, for being here as well. We'll uh, keep you guys, uh, guys, just so you know, too, um, in a couple of weeks, we've got Kim Ward coming out. Um, she's going to be teaching on Pinterest marketing. So I'm super awesome. stoked about that. Um, Pinterest is definitely one of those places you want to, you want to be plenty of content. You can post on there. They take videos, images, all kinds of stuff. So you want to take advantage of that. All right, guys, have a great one, Josh. Appreciate you, man. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.